Thank you very, very much. Many thanks to Mark Spiegel, to Art Basel. Um, it's actually an ongoing panel. Uh, Marie mentioned the title, The Artist Influence. So we thought, together with Mark and Marie, a couple of uh, actually years ago, when uh, because obviously this idea of ongoing, sustained kind of panels is very interesting because they can evolve over many years. And it started initially with the future of the museum. So we looked at museums in lots of different geographies. Then we looked at parallel realities, you know, artists as musicians, artists as poets, artists as architects. And we felt that it would be interesting to kind of have a very artist-centered series of panels. This is now the third one in the, in the series. And uh, to, the idea is always to invite an artist to actually suggest artists who have inspired them, who have influenced them, uh, heroes or heroines. Um, we're very delighted that Dominic Gonzalez Förster has accepted the invitation to, um, um, to do this here in Basel and actually uh, particularly happy that it happens in Switzerland because Dominic and I have known each other uh, ever since I made the first studio visit with her at the very beginning of the 90s. Uh, and we then, soon after that, worked on an exhibition in Guy's Appenzell very uh, near Basel, it's an hour and a half from here, in the pre-Alps, where I founded the Museum Robert Walser, and we installed uh, basically an homage, Dominic did, to Robert Walser. It was all about snow, because as many of you know, Robert Walser died on New Year's Day on his last walk you know, in the snow, and it was very mysterious, because the opening happened in May, uh, and very unusually so, during the opening it started to snow. So it's wonderful, of course, it's not the first time since then that Dominic is back, but everything in a way started in, in guys. And I remember also that everything started with Ange, Ange Lecha, because I asked Dominic at that time in 1990, 1991, who are your inspirations, who are your um, uh, influencers, and the uh, very first person you met was Ange Lecha. So we are very delighted that Ange accepted to be here. And when we talked with uh, Dominic, we soon then came also to Münster. Uh, we came to Kaspar König, uh, and of course, uh, Ange Lecha was in 1987 uh, in, uh, maybe we can begin the film, Ange was in 1987 in the Münster Sculpture Projects uh, founded by Kaspar König and Klaus Busmann, and he was also uh, in 1987 in Documenta. Uh, Dominique at the time was Ange's assistant, uh, was also one of Dominique's very first published texts, uh, was on Ange's work at the time. Uh, so from very early on in the conversations, it was our dream to have Ange here and uh, Kaspar Koenig here. Uh, very unfortunately, Kaspar Koenig cannot be with us today for, for health reasons, but we are very delighted to have his curator, Marianne Wagner, here. And there is another wonderful connection there to Switzerland, because Marianne is born in Schlieren, Zurich. Um, her family lives in Switzerland, and uh, Marianne co-curated with um, Kaspar Koenig uh, this year's, uh, and with Britta Peters also, there are three curators, this year's Skulpturen Projekte in, uh, in Münster. Uh, and of course, Dominique did 10 years ago in Münster a piece which has again to do with the theme of influencers and influences. So Dominique did an homage to several of the artists who were in earlier versions of uh, Münster. So all dots connect, and please give a very, very warm welcome to Dominique gonzalez Förster, to Marianne Wagner, and to Ange Lecher. <laughs> and Dominique, I thought maybe that we could start with you telling us a little bit um, about how you and Ange met and how it all started. Oh, oh, it, we're back in the 80s, and um, it's interesting. In uh, So I grew up in Grenoble, uh, like Philippe Pareno and Pierre Joseph. Um, it's, Grenoble is also the city of uh, Stendhal and many, many, great, um, many great urbanists, many great, and Grenoble is a kind of uh, laboratorium. It's a city surrounded with mountains. Um, in uh, in eighty one, when uh, when Mitterrand became the, the the socialist president, there was a big big movement of decentralization in France, and and art um, art centers started to grow all around, like the magasin in Grenoble. 
but also there was this small uh, art school uh, which had only which which was very small and that uh, the mayor then wanted to turn into a um, Art Deco, or, or he didn't want it to, to stay in art school. But we, we fought for that. We even slept one month in the school. And for that, we got two new professors. These two new professors were Jean-Luc Villemout and Ange Lechia. And I still remember very clearly the day when I saw them appearing. I had at that time lots of trouble with the other professors in the school, like big misunderstandings, and suddenly I felt like there was a <laughs> there was a possibility to 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 yeah to to play to exchange, and uh, very quickly we 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 were really having conversations and. Uh, I was, still, I was still in school when Ange arranged the first meeting with Suzanne Paget at the uh, Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris. She was directing the part called Arc at that time. You, you, also, you also worked there a lot with Migrateur and beautiful projects. And Suzanne, I, I, we will talk more about Caspar after, but I would say Suzanne, Ange, Caspar, and Jean-Luc are really are, are like, uh, I think without them, I wouldn't, I, I simply, I, would, I might exist in a different way, but not in this artistic way. And uh, so the, I, I, I still see Ange and Jean-Luc going down the stairs. I think it was after, their, after they did the, they, they had to do a kind of jury to, to become professor. And then they stayed in Grenoble. I think it changed the school. I think one reason why the Grenoble Art School, why Philippe Areno, why Pierre Joseph, why many other artists did or do what they're doing is, is because of the way. And, and then when, when Ange started the, the pavillon at Palais de Tokyo, which is this um, residency for artists, and when uh, Jean-Luc Villemout started to teach at the, um, at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts de Paris, you can feel that their way, their, their um, transmission, their way to, to, um, yeah, to, to make it possible for, for younger students, artists to, to to grow, develop is very special. But Ange, maybe you want to, to say something? <laughs> I want just to say when um, I meet uh, Dominique, when uh, Dominique uh, want for the first time show to me uh, her work, she said to me, the teacher said that, that my work is not so good. Uh, I don't know if, if you like that uh, I need to show to you. And when the first time uh, I saw the Dominic work, in fact, I was very impressed. It was the best work from uh, young artist I saw in my life. And uh, I pushed Dominic. Uh, Yes, she said that I uh, introduced her to Suzanne Paget. I, I did my first one-man show uh, at the Paris M Modern Museum of Art in uh, 85. And I asked immediately to Dominique to come with me to, to write uh, a text on, the, on my catalog to, to be my assistant of the shows, not to be my assistant to, to build, uh, to... Because <laughs> I didn't know how to do anything. Just any to, to help me to think the project. And uh, with Dominique, I did a show in uh, Grenoble Museum. And first time that uh, I visit the museum, just uh, when I was invited to sing a show. And uh, the first time I, I go with Dominique, we walk on, you remember? I remember very well because uh, we, we, we were visiting the spaces 
And Ange was saying, so these are the, the rules. Nothing on the ground, nothing on the walls, nothing <laughs> on the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is how it started. And uh, then you you came up with a beautiful idea because the museum had grids on the ground with, with um, I don't remember for what, and, and some for, deeper spaces. For the air conditioner. Yeah, and then you put lights in there, so you really found the way to... to and it was the same. Uh, I invited Dominique to come with me at uh, Munster. And yeah, because that's I'm 87 now. Yeah, now in 87. 86. Yeah. Now we're jumping too fast because in 86, yes. I went uh, for six months at the Kunstakademie in Düsseldorf, and this is where I met Kaspar the first time. He was doing his uh, seminar about Sculpture Project Münster, and the idea of the seminar was to invite one of the artists of the of the project every week. So one week was Jeff Wall, one week. And one week I remember so well the artist, the invited artist couldn't come. So what did Caspar do? He didn't say, uh, uh, sorry, we, we have to cancel. No, I said, oh, I have an idea, he said. And he took out from his pocket his address book and he <laughs> said, I'm going to read my, I, I don't know, I can't do his voice, it's too difficult <laughs> for me, but he said, I'm going to read my address book, you know, this is also about influences. I'm going to read every name and say why these people are in my address book, you know. <laughs> and so it went on, I think for 30 minutes he was, and you know, at this time people had address books, you know, you had a little book and you had lots of phone numbers and names. So he started with A, you know, and I think after 30 minutes, a kind of, there is always a student like that, you know, angry and a bit, you know, who was like, well, what's this, shy sub, <laughs> <laughs> and things. But this is for me, this is, I never forget this because this is like really, this is the Casper creativity in the moment, you know, like this is this incredible capacity to turn something into, you know, into something else. And it's such a, I mean, I don't know if he used this trick many times. I've witnessed it only once. So there is still the address book. And I'm actually also influenced, even if I don't only work with him for two years now. But it's very interesting. It's not only an address book. It's a big book, really size like this. And it's his Facebook. So he put in not only addresses, but also the faces, and that's his kind of um, way of um, dealing with the addresses. Oh, it's very beautiful because mm -hmm. it was also a huge influence on me because, of course, I worked with Casper at and the beginning. And you have this incredible book. Yeah, I then copied it and I started to also glue because he always glues things into these books as he also glues postcards. And uh, yeah, because I would just, you know, study his address book. It was yeah. somehow my education. Well, yeah. All the great artists were in it and he would always then with Tipex change addresses when people's address changes. It was like a palimpsest. It was a beautiful, totally. very beautiful object. And you know, I think the address book is, m is so important in his way to communicate with artists because I received postcards from Casper in 30 years and I believe I'm not the only one, which means if we collect, if we put all this postcards together and they became more and more collage you know the early ones are, are, are postcards with text and now they're really sophisticated collage and my idea is a big you know postcard exhibition because I think it's it's fantastic I never received an email or I received only phone calls and postcards the most beautiful postcards so now back back in 86 then, then Caspar came to Grenoble to the magasin where they started the first uh, curator, curator training. Um, this, was, this was really the idea of Jacques Guillaume, who was the director then, but also this decentralization. And at this time, Ange and Jean-Luc, you were all in. And, and Caspar saw your, saw your piece at the magasin. It's the, it's the two cars we saw on the film. 
And then and yeah, Ange, maybe you can tell us because we've been looking at the film. <laughs> it's been in a loop, and it began with this piece, with this amazing, iconic piece with the two cars. I like the, the idea of uh, meeting. I like the, for me the yes, uh, the art is all the time moving, changing direction, uh, and uh, I put these two cars. Th for me, was this idea of of meeting, and uh, Gaspar saw this work at magazin, and uh, he invited me to, to to be part at the uh, sculpture project uh, for the next year. It was uh, from uh, eighty seven, and after I invite Dominique to <laughs> to come with me in Munster to visit the place, to, to... And so you travel together, and it's interesting because <coughs> I found an interview between the two of you um, where you say that it's, you know, in a way, two old friends who combined ages, clock up a century, and we have been in constant contact for over 20 years. We made our first film together in 96, Il de Bote, from a collection of clippings, leftovers, mistakes, forgotten reels and the impossibility of writing a screenplay. But you also say that even before that, already in the 80s, you would always have conversations on films, lights, Corsica, Japan, love, and adventures. So I wanted to hear a little bit more about that, because these seem like, you know, great themes. Well, in, in I think one thing that, that, yeah, we shared from the very beginning is, uh, and that completely attracted me to Ange's work and practice, is his relation to cinema. That it, it is, it's like, uh, it's like an expanded cinema when he was using uh, Super 8 film in the space and the, the way he was refilming film which was parallel to the moment when uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's different, but it's similar in the way it's the 80s, like Richard Prince re-photographing photography, Ange refilming Callas, and, uh, and in fact, this also this relation to, um, to quotes, to references, to inspirations, like when you, when you refilm Callas, you you somehow it's it's not it's not uh, it's not copying it's not it's just you you bringing Callas as a very strong spirit and influence in your work and it becomes part of the work and I thought that I was very or when you used le but mépris this work of, of Maria Callas is in this moment uh, at Documenta in Frederation yes because it's part of the Greek uh, yeah. And and so the um, the this whole relation to cinema and also also to to quote you know to just uh, or, or to reference without you know like it's uh, art art is a is a endless like a combination recombination of influences is a collage is a permanent and I felt Ange had this spirit and also this freedom. To, to, to quote, to narrate, to use film, to use also the projector as, a, as just as a source of film, to make abstract films just from the light, and to, to build up very cinemat cinematographic situations. And this was so, f cinema was very much at the base of our conversations. And when film came, films came out like, uh, Sonatine by Kitano. I don't. Rem I don't know if you remember Ki Takeshi Kitano's films, and then films by Tsang Ming Yang like Vive l'amour. Vive l'amour is a is a film happening in Taipei where uh, you forget blue velvet. Uh, <laughs> not only you know if you say blue velvet, it it. It triggers many other things, but I will I will I will go back to that later. The but Vive l'amour, so films like that helped us to to make a decision to go from like um, loving cinema, watching films, including films as reference. Like I did this smaller uh, in eighty 
six this small um, matchbox, which was saying Blue Velvet, Jeff Koons, and but many also other ways to integrate film. But we moved from this to wanting to do our a uh, film. Uh, and but we we really we, we were excited with the idea of a feature film, except we couldn't write it, you know. Like we were, comp it's what you were saying. We were completely blocked on the scenario thing. We were like it was very painful. Like we were, and so one day we said, let's do another method. Let's watch all what you filmed, like in because you started filming from when you were a student, no. In, in Corsica and Super 8. So we were watching like 20 years of, on, on all, you know, on Super 8, on big tapes, like, you know, you, you wouldn't believe <laughs> now that it's all dematerialized, all formats. For hours we were watching, 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 and from that, so it's coming a bit after. Just after. It's uh, we 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 manage, we we found a way to do Ile de Beauté, and Ile de Beauté is became a film which has no actors. Is it works more like on the idea of um, of uh, you see what you see what of the camera subjective, and uh, and it's really. The, the, the only text is coming from uh, pop songs, like French Top 50. So they, it's, it's really a construction, but it's also what is very special there. It's all video. It's and possible to have the sound of the movie. Ah, yeah, yeah, that would be nice. Thanks.
Yes, the sound, uh, please. So, so how did you do this film? Because it's sort of very unusual, you know, in terms yeah. of that, um, uh, the way you, you collaborated on that. I mean, Julius Guattari talked a lot about how, it, how complicated it is, you know, for two people to write a book together. How, how, how does such a collaboration work? How did well, you we, were, we were watching all these tapes for hours and, and building up this structure. Il de beauté, the title, Isla Island of Beauty, is the name that is given to Corsica, but is also, and it could be a bit of a cheesy name, but it's also the name of a boat. It's a boat that crosses between Nice and uh, Bastia, or Marseille and Bastia. It, it, it was a, it's, it's also a boat I took as a child to go to Corsica, and, but Ile de Beauté is also Japan there, because the, the film goes from Corsica to Japan and back and forth. And is, it has some uh, bio, of course, autobiographical aspect for Ange, but it's also, it's put in a completely different way. We invent, we invent a story where, where, but as you see, where, where cinema always comes in, like in waves. Where, they, where, where there are a lot of, uh, there are also lots of scenes in the mountains. And the film, the film, what, this is the second one. This is gold. This is gold that is more based on our, on our Californian desert traveling. But in, in Ile de Beauté, the thing is, um, it was also the time where a film, a real film, was in 35 millimeter. So it, the first time it was shown to an audience was a 35 millimeter copy. And we had like uh, many people completely not understanding. They were expecting a film with actors. They were expecting a scripted film. They were expecting. By now, I would say this is from 96. By now, cinema has changed completely, and it looks very normal. This was also the moment where Sophie Kahl showed her um, No Sex Last Night, which was such also a beautiful adventure into cinema in a different way, because you have to imagine that these films were made with a very low budget compared to uh, and a completely different practice of cinema, a very free one where, where you edit, where you decide this is cinema. So, this is for this, and then and then Ange made other films, and I did other films alone. But I think I would because you were filming since you were always filming since you were 15, or I don't know. I never had a I never had a camera. I never filmed anything until I was 30. Like I, you really, and I never went to any film school. I, I have the feeling you really brought me into cinema in your way, like not in the way of a film school. Or and uh, also, we come back at the, 
uh, as a way to teach uh, in the school. I remember I bring Philippe Pareno to, to so a soccer, uh, a soccer games. And also, I remember we go to see uh, Le Mépris of Jean-Luc Godard. It's interesting in because scene. I wanted to ask you about Godard because there is a very interesting interview, Ange, about the show you did in Nantes recently, La Mer Allée avec le Soleil, and uh, it's of course Pierrot Le Fou there, which, you know, uh, which gives the title, and in a way, Godard has always been there in the conversation with both of you, because I remember when I visited Dominique, you know, for the first time, beginning of the 90s, and we talked about Ange, and Dominique told me about your both having this connection to Godard, and of course one of my favorite exhibitions ever was the exhibition of Godard at the Centre Georges Pompidou, uh, one a landmark exhibition, not enough known, not enough published, um, where Godard experimented with an exhibition as a format. Uh, in the course of the exhibition, he fired the curator. He made a press statement <laughs> saying that basically uh, he's now curating it himself, so he got rid of the curator. Uh, and you were part of this show. So I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit more about the connection to Godard, this exhibition, and uh, and your films. For the, for the show, uh, he invited me just to uh, have um, a double page in the catalog, in the book. And uh, it's difficult to explain because <laughs> I don't have the footage, but sometimes I take just a part of movie of Jean-Luc Godard and uh, I edit in, uh, in loop and uh, the, the sense, the, the way uh, of the move, and yes, the completely, uh, the, 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 the part of the movie became completely another things. Uh, I show it in uh, 97 in the uh, Musée d'Art Moderne. You remember this loop with Brigitte Bardot forget that I say. Uh, uh, about Godard, one time I received uh, a phone call from Jean-Luc Godard, and he said to me, Ange, uh, you are my favorite uh, artist. Uh, I, um, we have a meeting at Café Beaubourg in Paris. I wait you at uh, 3 p.m. Uh, Friday, I wait you at 3 p.m. Friday. Oh, I was very impressed. Uh, I call all my friends. Uh, Jean-Luc Godard uh, invite me to have uh, a, cof a coffee. I was, I go to the Friday at the Café Beaubourg at 3 p.m. In fact, it was a Philippe Pareno joke. No. <laughs> <laughs> This is great. Because Philippe is very known for doing the best Godard imitations ever. There is even a piece by Philippe with Godard's voice, <laughs> and he's just, he's just the, the best Godard. And Godard, had his, at his most political period, was in Grenoble, you know, at La Villeneuve. This is where he was. So I think with Philippe and Ange, there is also this, yeah, this Godard-Grenoble spirit but it makes me think of another thing, which is like, I think filmmakers like Jean-Luc Godard, like, like, um, like Tsai Ming Young, like David Lynch, or we really, they become our cinematographic clocks. We live in the reason of their films, like uh, this is so clear now for me with the new Twin Peaks. It's like really, we've, for a long time, every David Lynch film was like new clues for the futures, new, you know, new ideas, new ways. And again, it's such a beautiful coincidence that the year of Munster is also the year of the coming back of Twin Peaks, because I have the feeling that through this new Twin Peaks, David Lynch, through what he's worked on the last 15 or, 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 or 25 years, he has really, managed to become the film, the, the series, it's an exhibition. What you go through is he has become so free in it, is such a, 
And when we were um, installing No Man's Time at Villa Arson in 91 with Eric Troncy, we were, we were watching Twin Peaks every, every week. We were, we were, because it was, it was like now, every week. And it was so inspiring. And I, it really, I have the feeling that Munster is the same. It's like this, that this time thing that the fact that it's every 10 years, it's a clock, it's a cycle that makes things become visible in a very different way. And working with time this way, like in the visual arts, sometimes we have smaller, shorter cycles, and it's very beautiful to bring in much longer cycles because they seem to, to leave time and space in between to have more things to happen. This is, of course, the, the big, big beauty of um, Le Temps Retrouvé at the end of La Recherche du Temps Perdu de Proust, is this, this revelation that time is the ultimate culture or is the way to, to make something happen. And I think the, what, this is what we discussed, the, 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 the fantastic invention with Munster is this 10 year cycle. It's a ritual, it's a ritual. It's a ritual, we compared it once to the, uh, to the Dogon festival, which Jean Rouge filmed and happened every 60 years. It gave us an idea. We, we really want, we, we have an idea of an exhibition that's happening every 50 years. <laughs> because we're so, this, this, I think this time dimension, but I can really, because from 87 till now in Münster, the paradigm of sculpture has changed every time. And it's not every year that you can see changes and get so close to how, how a medium is evolving and how, but I think through, through Münster, you get really this chance to see like now this year, the way, the way performative art comes in, the way, it's, it's so interesting that it's not only about this artist or that artist, it's really an exhibition as a way to measure and identify changes in a practice. And that's actually a transition, a wonderful transition to, to, to Münster, of course, because it is, it is this ritual, as Dominic said, and we, um, uh, we here with announce, because we've never really announced it in public, that from next year onwards we are going to do this exhibition, Dominic and I, which happens every 50 years. So it will be um, actually 2018 and then again uh, 2068, correct? Yeah. 68, which, which is a perfect date. Yeah, which will be <laughs> perfect. 68, 68. Now, um, let's talk more about this ritual, because of course, um, Marianne, you're a great expert on the history of, uh, of this ritual, of these, you know, four decades of, of Münster, big publications uh, are, being, are being planned. And I think it's interesting because it's a nice transition here from Godard, from cinema to ritual. Because Ange, you, in your exhibition in Nantes, in this interview, you talk about the mépris with Brigitte Pardo, and you talk about this idea how there is really a ritualistic moment in it which, uh, uh, you know, is very much uh, as well the, the ritual of the exhibition. Now, I was kind of interested in knowing a little bit more about this archive project, how uh, you will archive the, the four, you know, decades of, of Münster ritual. And this will lead us then, of course, also again to Dominic's piece, because Dominic's piece from 10 years ago is a form of archive. Well, I also think that this 10-year um, rhythm, which is really One slow, now oh, we can we maybe we switch, yeah, we if we can. can have, uh, we can stop the film and we can have the PowerPoint presentation with the images. So the, the ten rhythm is one of the most important thing regarding that exhibition in Münster, which also separates it or which makes it just different from other formats like a biannual or um, also the documenta. There was, for example, a big effort made by the city and other people bringing it to five-year rhythm, and Casper was the one who voted for that um, about four or five years ago and said, okay, I give my head in the ring again and be curator again for the fifth time um, that it not comes to that point that they will change that rhythm. 
So um, that is one of the important points regarding the curator um, who is doing that um, whole format, but also regarding the city, it's quite important that it's this 10 year rhythm. It's also a kind of generation which is changing during that time. For example, the students are changing. It's the third biggest university town, even if, if it's a small town, a college town. So um, students are completely changing. And for example, this year we noticed that most of the students who had been there last time are there already having children. And so the next generation is in but the new ones don't know anything about it. But the older inhabitants of Münster know it, and they know it like layers over the city. So, um, for example, there is one really nice anecdote I want to share with you, is um, we invited a photographer. His name is Alexander Rischer from Hamburg. He's making black and white photographs. He's not so famous, but doing really an intense insight um, in places when he's photographing. And we ask him um, to um, walk along the idea of Michael Escher, who has parked a caravan over every week, over 19 weeks, over every edition from 1977. And then he was invited again four times. And for sure, we would have invited him also the fifth time, but he has died in 2012. So this is also something which has to do with the archive. Um, maybe we can later come to that because he's now part of an archival exhibition. But with that work, it was interesting because Alexander Rische went through the city with his camera, photographing the places of Michael Escher in his own way. And he was asked um, nearly at every place from people living there, oh, is the Escher coming again? So people knew only because there was someone with a camera and no caravan <laughs> that's about that work. So that's also part of that 10-year rhythm that everyone knows, OK, in 2011, it's there again. So this is really also important, even if you cannot really measure it, how, it, it's, um, how important it is for the city, it is uh, quite big relevance. Because it's an exhibition in time and space. And Dominic, when we spoke about Münster, you said that you were interested in the layers of time and how they would allow you to take a different approach to art. And you told me that for you going to Münster and working there in 10 years ago, in, in 2007, was very much like writing uh, a novel. Uh, for you, it was uh, writing a, a text in space, a visual text that would tell a story. And you called it actually Le Roman de Münster, the, ro the, the novel of Münster. And, and, uh, uh, and that, of course, is interesting because it's something which appears in a lot of your works because it's, it's the connection between space and text. It is a kind of a, a constant oscillation. You're almost like an oscillator between text and space and space and text. Uh, you call it a, a to and fro between the two. Some texts produce space, some spaces produce text. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the Roman de Münster, which, of course, has a lot to do with what Marianne just told us? Yeah, I, w I, I was and I'm still obsessed with uh, maximalist novels, maximalist novels being novels that are more than 1,000 pages and like Thomas Pynchon or, or, and also novels that include the whole, the world, like many places, many characters, many situations, many moments, periods. And um, I, I thought about uh, I thought about a sculpture project like a maximalist novel, and also like a incredible palimpsest in the city, the layers of these different moments, and uh, and this is how it became this roman de Münster, which is it's a series of quotes. It, this this is really this is really a method borrowed from literature. It's a very Ben Walter Benjamin like way. To, to produce a text. So um, uh, a selection of the, of the sculptures which appeared uh, between 77 and, uh, and, uh, two and 97 were placed in the same, uh, maybe we can have a, yeah. Maybe we can get some yeah. images of it. Yeah. Yeah, we have it here. Where we where, where placed um, in the, following following the plan from the city like 
in relation the way they were and, and reduced to 25%. And uh, the, the same way, you know, when, when we discuss the passage of time, I also have to remember that when I went with, um, with uh, to, 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 to think about, to prepare it, uh, my daughter was so small, I had to push her <laughs> in a trolley. And I was leaving the trolley in the middle of the grass to, to, to use it as a, you know. <laughs> to me she didn't notice because she was sleeping. But uh, that was my, and I realize now she's almost a teenager. So there is, there is also this great, and I think the, the, it was a kind of park became really popular with uh, children. There are many pictures where you see because of this, uh, of this uh, Alice, of Pedem, Alice in Wonderland relation to scale and that suddenly, you know, cultures that are much larger, you know, become. And, and also I think it was a very strong excitement to suddenly uh, see them all together because because normally you have to you have to walk from one to the other, and they never appear. What I, I think what I also wanted to emphasize, and this is this is going back to Casper, it's a fascination for curating, for curating as a way to produce not only an exhibition, but uh, sometimes I've called this the sensation d'art, or to produce a relation to art and an artistic experience. And really to say there is a very strong proximity between curating mm -hmm. and an art artistic practice. And like the same way when Benjamin quotes and it becomes literature, quoting, and in this sense it's really this, can also become something else. And therefore, it's very interesting that you didn't add a single um, object to it. So you only use the other ones, really having this gesture of curating and not putting in an own one. So um, Yeah, because it's a meta structure in a way. I think that the, what, what appears there is really, yeah, it's the idea. It's also, it's also an homage to, to, to Caspar and the, the idea, also the, the um, yeah, the the curatorial, the, the, the beauty of the curatorial approach, it's really, but also a chance to, to a time machine to put together works that would never meet otherwise. And uh, therefore I was very surprised when a few months ago Casper called me <laughs> and uh, suddenly <laughs> I hear his voice and he's like, Dominique, we have an idea. <laughs> and that's when Marl enters the picture. Yeah, but I was so, I was like, and well, you, you. The, re the reason was this, um, it's really for me also as an archive, the whole work also is an archive of Münster. And when we went down in the storage in the preparation time of Münster, um, so in the museum there are different storages and some are more far away, so some are not visited so often. And after 10 years, <laughs> so there's it again, we went to um, a storage which is a bit far away from the museum and we came across some of the elements of um, Dominic. And we first were not sure if these were the original works or how they came there. So um, we unwrapped everything and um, realized that there had been from the whole, I think, more than 30 um, elements. Um, 11 were still there. And nobody knew why, because normally um, works are deinstalled de and um, recycled or sometimes also sold, but most of it is just deinstalled and never used again. And these 11 elements were just there. So it was also like burying in the archaeology of um, Münster and in the whole archive um, of the exhibition. And therefore we ask um, Dominique if we could do um, like a small presentation with these 11 elements, which are now really part of the archive. And this was um, a great um, surprise that you agreed also to donate it to the museum. And it's now um, in Marl, which is a town we cooperate with. Yeah, that's an image of it. 
And as you can see, it's a really special architecture. It's the Museum Glaskasten Mall um, in a city nearby, 60 kilometers away from Münster. And this museum has a kind of um, glass box as an opening situation where you enter the whole institution. And within this entrance hall and in this um, foyer, um, the 11 fragments are there. So you have again this connection to the space outside, but also a connection to the archive and the inside. Because when you go down the stairs, there's a small presentation about the models of all or of at least um, some of the works um, of sculpture projects during the years. And it's of course perfect because in a way, Mal, for those of you who haven't been there, I had never been there before and Dominic urged me to go there and I urge you all to go there. It's an amazing experience to do Münster and Mal because Mal is like, you know, if Dominic's piece is a mini Münster, Mal is a, a mini, mini Brasilia. So it's this amazing sync, you know, uh, it's really in sync. And it's a mini Brasilia which was built for more than 200,000 people, but these 200,000 people never came. So, you know, there's still only 70,000 people living there. So there's also a certain, you know, uh, s you know, sadness about it because it's of course, as many utopias, you know, a failed utopia. It's built uh, by the Dutch, very well-known Dutch architect Bakema in 57. I mean, it's, it's really Beautiful the perfect spot hall. for you, no? Yeah, I couldn't believe it. I had never heard of Mal, and when <laughs> I arrived, I was like, I was walking around, I was like, this, is, this has been, you know, invented for, it, it's really, it's really a, a very, very strange place. And, and when Caspar called me and he was so excited about Mal, I couldn't, but when I saw it, I realized, and, and also Mal has this, has this long history with, uh, with outdoor sculpture, and I think it was also the idea to connect. Yeah, this was the whole idea, that you have one city in Münster, which is a reconstruction completely, like a fake situation after World War II, um, and in Mal, you had a completely different idea, not of reconstruction, but to have a new vision of a city after World War II. So they rebuilt, they didn't rebuild anything. They made a kind of new city like Brasilia, so but in a small scale. And this is also regarding, I think, an interesting aspect regarding to um, Dominique's work, that you have this connection of a city which is in a small scale built as a vision and also a work which tells this kind of history. And Mal was um, a bit earlier than Münster. They started before with um, collecting public art and also with um, bringing it to the public in the public space around the Majors Hall um, mainly. And Münster started a bit later. Mm -hmm. So there is a quite um, interesting uh, history to compare with these two cities. Now, one thing I was wondering before, I want to have to answer questions for, for Ange, but before that, maybe uh, another question to Dominic about this piece, because I was kind of wondering, because there are so many projects in Münster to choose from. How, how did you choose? Because it's interesting. I mean, there is, of course, Michael Asher, you already explained. But there is also Isa Gensken, there is Thomas Schütte. What, what prompted the, the choice? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's, it's now that I, I, I see the Michael Asher on, on the right, I just want to say that I wanted to play it outside of the glass casting because I wanted to give it this mobility and this, but it, it was a bit difficult. But the, the, when I remember when I, wa when I was working on the selection for this maximalist novel, what, what appears is that some works cannot be reproduced without their context. So in fact, it, it, this, is, this was one, one way to choose the works, is that you, you can't, some are so linked to, to a place, or you, know, you, you couldn't build the whole, so, then, which means that most most of of the of the ones that were there in two thousand and seven look more like sculpture sculpture in a way because because they have to have this autonomy and uh, but the the they also have very different ways to function. I remember that the mini Namchun peak i don't know you you can you can see the foreground the, yeah in the foreground has its location, 
outside, like in a really, in a beautiful, like next to a small river. But I also. There's another vehicle. There's a second vehicle. That's the Asher vehicle. The and that's it's Robert. The it's also one of my favorite pieces, Robert Filio. Can you tell us about that? Uh, well, it's, it's just so beautiful that you have two vehicles, but there in Mali you also have a third one, the Vostel car that you don't see there, which is giant size. And it's beautiful that the, um, the shooter's cherries, they became, they have now a kind of a new twin. Actually, there is a new story you are opening with that kind of presentation in Mal, because when you go around the corner, you even can see it from a certain point of view. Um, you see to a new column, which is made now out of concrete, for sure, it's Mal, um, which is completely made out of concrete. So you see another column, a bit bigger um, scale than in Münster, with a melon on the top of it. So this was also a draft from 90, 87 of Thomas Schütte, but then he went for the cherry mm -hmm. and realized that in Münster, so now uh, Marl has this family fruit, and it's really nice because it's when the you... The watermelon, it's so yeah. beautiful. <laughs> and on the parking lot, yes. like he really wanted the rough place, and it's, yeah. so, it's so beautiful. Now Marl is asking, who of you has been to Marl? Can you please raise your hands? Yeah. So for all, that's great. For all the others, it's very urgent to go to Mal and, of course, to, to Münster. Now, uh, I wanted to kind of bring it back to Ange. And and just oh, one say second, the yeah. Dan Graham pavilion. The Dan Graham, yes. Because you saw it, you saw it in Ange's film, where you saw Dan Graham walking behind and... Uh, taking, yeah. taking pictures. Uh, it's possible to, to put, again, the movie uh, at the beginning, where, when there is a two soccer... Um, but the two goals, the two, two goals. soccer goals. Can do that later. No? Maybe in the meantime, I can mention that the pavilion is again there. So we put it out of the storage for that edition. So if you come to Münster, you see the glass pavilion of Dan Graham for three and a half months. After. Yes. Yes, because uh, you, you speak about the, the weight of the story. When uh, I did this work in 87, there is two Germany, East Germany and West Germany. And uh, in a soccer game, the, the, the but, the soccer place, are, the goals, very, yeah. are very far. And this idea with Gaspar, we ask, we try to have one, from, one uh, but from uh, West Germany and one from East Germany. And we, we put one against one. Just, and now the meaning uh, has changed because there is, will be the reunification. There is. But no Ange, this idea of you know encounter, we spoke about it also this morning at breakfast. No, that it's a it's a rencontre, it's an encounter, and it's interesting because I I read a very interesting interview the other day, where you talk about the sea, and of course the film Dominic and Judy together starts with this beautiful beautiful footage of the sea. And I also remember, as I worked at the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris for many years, you know, with Suzanne Paget, we had your piece of the sea in the stairway. So every morning when I came to work, I saw the sea. And in a way, you said in this interview that all your work is about an encounter. It's an encounter of two goals, it's the encounter of two cars, but it's also the encounter of the sea with the earth, because you say that it creates, these encounters can create a zone de turbulence, they can create an interesting tension. I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit more about these multiple encounters you, you create, because I think it connects very much to Dominique. Uh, you, you speak uh, also, Marianne, speak about the new generation. I think the wave are all the time the same things, but different things. And uh, I like the, this uh, image of the waves, because it's all the time the same, but never the same. And uh, one need another. One wave push 
another wave. And, uh, like our friend Jean-Luc said, and he took this uh, is a sentence, I think it comes from uh, Thailand, same, same, but different. Uh, Dan Graham with uh, shooting Dominique at uh, a sculpture project. <laughs> Jeff Koons. Gaspar Koning. With Liana Sonaband. Dominique. You can see from the large shoulders that it's very empty. <laughs> no, but it's true. Is this building still there? This like store? Which that one was do you on mean? the side, you know, like the modern that was behind the goals. Yeah, I that's think, still there. I think. Some of the works will stay in Münster and did stay over the last decades. And they are also part of our catalog here. In So when you have a look through the new catalog, you also see these works which stayed in the city. And you also um, meet some of the works which are in your work now. And there will be a publication within about one and a half or two years also referring to um, archival stuff and to documents. So um, we will take up on that discussion with all the works again um, in the meantime. Yeah, we just spoke, we, we spoke with Caspar this morning. He, he, he spoke about the book and Ange said he filmed, he has so much more material, so maybe some can come into the book. And I think it's beautiful that there will be also a book which, which has all the moments together. But I am also interested in one question about your work in Münster. Maybe it's, all, it's also about time and um, connecting and meeting. So um, it's a lot described as a kind of retrospective of the whole sculpture projects. How do you see this? Because for me, it's more than meet something meet together, but um, it's often described like that. I think I think this is one is one 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 uh, great way to describe it, and then it's also this 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 park this ensemble is also in the context of other gardens and parks I I I, I made where I where which were really um, trying to develop a different uh, a completely different notion of the park. The park is very, is an incredible, is incredibly close to the exhibition space, is really a, a type of exhibition. But the Jardin à la Française, the, the English garden, all, all, all sorts of park have had their rules of composition elements. And this also enters the idea of imagining a park that is a kind of graph composed of very heterogeneous elements and not based on symmetry, not based on, on, uh, on uh, composed walks, but rather on constellations, points that have connections and that could come from different places in the world, like in Castle, the plant for escape had a chair from Chandigarh combined with, with a rock from Mexico. With, and so it's, it's also, it also enters that, that re, yeah, research or, or, or idea of what, how can, how can a park, how can an outdoor place, the same way like a Chinese garden combines literature, combines architecture, combines plants, 
how can we invent an, another type of park? Is there is also this dimension. So Very there is a dimension specific to Munster, and it comes in a wide, wider... Uh, yeah, like your pin... I mean, there are so many parks you did, Dominique, realized and unrealized. I mean, more recently, we saw your great Pinchon Park in, in Portugal, the new museum by Amanda Levitt, where... She designed a museum connecting, uh, you know, the river and the city in such an interesting way. Uh, and you developed there a park, which is it's really a park for aliens to watch us. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, Pin Pinchon Park is also is, is continuing these links between literature, the Roman Münster, then the Ballard Garden, which is a full homage to, to G.J. Ballard as someone who completely changed our aesthetics and the same way Kafka shaped our vision of the 20th century, I think the 21st century is Ballardian in our, in the way we see concrete, in the way we see. And um, the, so the Pynchon Park is, is of course an homage to Pynchon, to Thomas Pynchon, and is a place where it's, it's a kind of tale for the 21st century. So imagine a group of extraterrestrials. They want to see how humans behave. So they start to think of a place that would be nice for humans. And they, they realize human likes books, but they don't really know how they use books. So they make these carpet books where humans can lie on. And it's a story of uh, how it's also very much, of course, this tale, it's about extraterrestrial and humans, but you can soon turn it to humans and animals and many other situations where one species observing another one and where exhibition is, is also a place, a, a philosophical place for thinking, you know, relationship different all sorts of relationships. I, I truly believe in exhibition as a philosophical model. And that of course leads us also to some more, you know, imaginary gardens, unrealized gardens. And in a way, you know, for me talking about uh, about Münster, it's about and that's my last question I wanted to ask you because I think we then will open it to the floor for your questions. Um, you know, it's the big, big topic of the unrealized project, which I've always been very fascinated by, and <coughs> it's to do with Alighiero Boetti, because in, you know, 1987, we are back to 1987, everything today has to do with 1987, uh, I met, you know, Alighiero Boetti for the first time, and um, went to see him as a, uh, I was a student then to Rome, and, and Boetti told me that it's very strange that artist practice is often squeezed into existing formats, artists are invited to do, you know, a biennale, or an art fair, or a gallery show or a museum show, all these different formats, you know, there are for artists to exhibit. Münster, of course, is different, but still, you know, it's a, a also an existing format. And he said that there's all these other things he would like to explore and that we should look at artists and realize projects and make them happen, which is I, what I did. And so we started with Guitar Tosa to do a book called Unbuilt Roads, which actually we did with Casper. It was launched in Münster uh, 97. We launched it in 97 with 101 unrealized projects and at that time we looked a lot at your archive at the Münster archive because of course there are many unrealized projects they are now exhibited in Mal in the basement of the museum there is an exhibition of projects realized and unrealized and it's interesting that some have been realized since then for example in 97 you know we saw the Bruce Nauman which then got realized in 07 and one of the rare occasion where I think the exactly same image was the same week on the cover of Freeze and Art Forum and many other magazines uh, you know, so so that but that was in '97, an un, an unrealized you know an unrealized project. So I wanted to kind of ask you a little bit, the three of you, to tell us about the unrealized projects. I wanted to ask Marianne to tell us about some of her favorite unrealized Münster projects, and then ask Dominique and Ange to tell us about some projects in their practice, which are unrealized and you know dreams. And there's a you know, whole range of why projects are unrealized. They can be too big to be realized. They can be too small to be realized. They can be censored. They can be forgotten. Uh, and as Doris Lessing, the late Doris Lessing always told me when we discussed this in London, she always said, and we should never forget, you know, there are also the projects we simply don't dare to do. There is also self-censorship, kind of you know crazy projects we somehow 
keeping our lockers and don't dare to do this. It's all part of the complex of the unrealized. So that's my last question. Maybe start with Marianne and Münster and then end with uh, Dominique and Ange in terms of their artistic practice. When you look in the archive, there are a lot of these projects. For example, for 1987, um, in the catalog, um, you can see that uh, it's named um, 60 projects for uh, that edition, but only 30, only the half was realized, so it was a big issue then. And I just grab one, which is, I think, interesting next to the Bruce Nauman, is the one of Aisha Erkman in 1997. She made about five or four proposals for um, a quite simple gesture on the cathedral, on the west um, facade, um, for changing um, part of the windows there to a clock. But then when you have a clock, there is also um, the time measured like this. So the cross would have been changed and the church didn't want that. So she walked around that idea again and again and um, after it was not possible, she said, okay, well, then I'm not changing my territorium. I still keep uh, it to the church, my idea. And she flew with a helicopter with um, figures from the museum's collection, the Prabenda figures. Um, over the top of the museum and the church around um, every Sunday on Sunday morning after the um, church <laughs> was finished. And it, that was a big provocation, but a very simple gesture. So um, this is shown in the archive um, that there had been other proposals, but one which was then realized completely different, but with the same power. And um, we are also intending to do a small exhibition about these unreali unrealized projects in about one or two years. So it's something which is really on our mind in Münster. And Ange, can you tell us about some of your projets non réalisés? I never have this problem because if it's not possible to, to realize, realize the, the project, I change ID. It's a new ID. Uh, <laughs> All the time <laughs> is possible because uh, I ad adapt my uh, idea, my project at the reality. If it's impossible, I don't have idea. And Dominique, your unrealized projects? Oh, one one is a one is a film I wanted to do is um, I wanted to bring a, a two two more than hundred years old. Um, man, I admire together for a film uh, Manuel de Oliveira and um, and uh, our great uh, Brazilian um, Oscar. architect Oscar Niemeyer. I wanted them to have a conversation on a bench in a park in Rio, and uh, <laughs> it was really a dream. It was also a dream about time, like, and what they would discuss. Uh, they, they both obsessed with women. They both had this, and it was so, it became another film, but in, uh, but it, that, this is, yeah, this is one of the, but it's also, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, about this one because of time, like what, you know, uh, wha what it can produce. I sometimes I wonder, you know, like in 50 years, what will our exhibition be? What, and I think this, this, um, I think to and in, in physics at the moment there are so many things happening. When you read at the moment, when you read, you know, you, I'm absolutely sure that the you know the the relation to time is a crucial one in relation to the artwork and will become stronger and stronger because lots of works let's say in the renaissance or were not necessarily made with the same relation to time and were not there wasn't the knowledge that an artwork now you know you know it's the hit, the story of an art, the way it's kept the way it's traveling the way it's moved the way it's collected the way i mean this is this is all a new knowledge and this is transforming the work from inside also but I'm just thinking, Dominique, I mean, your project with uh, Nima and the Oliveira, on the one hand, it's difficult to realize it now because they, of course, 
both passed away, both much older than 100 years old, but both passed away. But through your uh, apparitions and, you know, legendary figures you bring back, because of course, that was my very, very last question, you know, because talking about influences, one thing which of course is, is very important in your work is that you actually bring these people back. <laughs> Can you tell us about that? Because the conversation on the bench in theory could happen. <laughs> could happen. We could even do it together because it would need to... Now there is a, an, another dimension of, of influences and there is this very strong relation to living beings and this is, goes from my aunt to my daughter, Ange, friends, so, ma so many friends and I think I also remember my, the first visit to your, to your apartment in, in, um, in Switzerland where I discovered if I can, can I describe your apartment yes, at course, that yes. time? So I arrive in the apartment. It's a gallon, yes. <laughs> if I remember it well, because it really, <laughs> there was on the right, there was a room that was very, very arranged with lots of boxes, lots of boxes, each box for an artist, but lots of boxes. And I think in the center there was a kind of chaise longue or kind of couch. But this room was really uh, pristine, very arranged. Then there was another room which was the opposite. For me, it, it one of my worst taboo walking on books. I had to walk on books in this room because you had about 30 centimeters of books open and piled up in the whole room. Is it true? Yeah, it was boeti, ordine disordine, ora and disorder. <laughs> And, and, your, and your desk was at the end of the room, so there was no chance, you know, to, to, to go to the desk without walking on the books. Then there was the kitchen, and of course the kitchen, the kitchen wouldn't have been a kitchen if it didn't have the beautiful Fishley and Weiss installed, you know, so you couldn't use it as a kitchen, but it was. And then you had a very small bedroom and I remember because you also invited me to stay there and I was wondering, you know, if I would sleep on the leases or where. And then you said, no, I have a meeting at four in the morning with my assistant. I won't sleep. So Dominique, please take my bed. <laughs> <laughs> and for, you know, for me, this is, and the next day we went up to, to, the, to the robot. But this is, this is for me as influential, as important as, any other, you know, very strong exhibition or film I've seen, like you, your relation to art is is in the is in the moment. And uh, last week when you showed me what Philippe Areno now did for your London apartment, I was like, I thought, this is this is it, you know. It has it has to be where we are, and it has to be a way to develop. That is not just uh, through institutions, or it's this is. I mean, this. I think the you know the thing. It's there. There could not be a better conclusion. Dominique, Marianne, and Ange, thank you very much, and thank you all. <laughs> and I do think that we have time for a few questions. So, if there are questions for, yeah, we've got a question here in the middle. If we can have the mic. Super nervous because Dominique is a total hero. I want. I wanted to know about the relationship between um, the gaze. I, I was thinking about like the pictures generation and how many of the female artists were interested in different forms of the gaze. And then Ange did that piece of Maria Callas, which you can see in Documenta, which is very much about the camera turned on Callas. And I know you've done a Callas. And even in this film, there's a lot of people shooting you, <laughs> like Dan Graham or Ange and just the, the relationship that you have with the gaze in your work with Collis. Well, the, the, in, in, um, in this Callas apparition, there is a, um, it's really, it's it's really um, getting. It's really about uh, um, 
is not only bringing Calas inside or visiting Calas or exploring Calas, is really, uh, yeah, letting, yeah, it's both. It's exploring Calas as a, almost as a space, as a room, as a, and it's it's also letting her enter the the best descriptions I found of that are in you know are in seance of you know I is I'm so, I'm sorry to bring that here this way but it's really like uh, in in when when you have a seance and you have people grouping in a, for for and and convinced or not with spiritualism somewhere, you know. And when you let spirits enter, strange things happen. And there is, so it's not only, I understand your question from, uh, but you have to see that it's, um, it, becomes, it becomes very different as soon as you look at it from the inside, I would say. It's a totally so, I've I've experienced I I know what you mean because I've experienced things from different sides. Um, I usually don't enter so much the female or not female artist discussion because I I feel it's it and and I'm so happy that now we've reached a point where it's not that binary and we, where you can have a much more, you know. I've always felt more like um, a, <laughs> a man who dresses like a woman, but wants to be, you know. I, it's, we Once with Arthur Lindsay, we had this idea, talking about unrealized projects of a film that would have only characters that would have that many levels, you know, like, or you, are, uh, you know, you are, are Simone de Beauvoir, but speaking to Jean-Paul Sartre, who sees you not only as Simone de Beauvoir, but as, you know, or me, or, or so it's much more, it's, it's about this gaze, but it's also about v many, many layers. And some are, some are visiting an influence or, or, um, or let's say uh, uh, it's you know a, a, an ensemble of references or, or, or from from inside, some from outside, and then there is this uh, very strange zone. It's almost like the the zone that is described in Stalker by Tarkovsky, um, where where things. W where you have new laws of physics operating. In fact, what we're looking for in, I think, some time in the art is different physics applying to a medium or, or and now when I'm talking about physics, I'm trying to think of, uh, of it in the, in the newest ways that we think about, you know, like wh where you really, at the moment, it's really, they're really, new definitions coming up of time, of, of relation to space. Of, so it's, it's really, it's combining very, uh, of course, very physical, ex cultural experiences, physical or biological experiences, but together with, um, yeah, with art and physics in a, in a special way. I don't know, maybe it becomes too it's super interesting. I was thinking this morning, you know, about David Deutsch and the great book, uh, you know, the quantum physicist and the great book, Fabric of Reality, where he talks about parallel realities. And so that came to my mind when you spoke. Can we take another question? Maybe one more. I think we can take one more question. Time wise. Yeah, there's a question here in the middle. If you can have the mic, please. Thank you for the for the speech and the talk. Uh, I have a question to both, actually both artists. Um, you have been speaking about persons that influences you, and you have been speaking about art pieces that influences you, such as a reference to Godard and so on and so forth. I wonder if there is something, uh, maybe politically or what is happening on the world. Let's, let's make it big. 
uh, on the world that actually presently influences your work? What is it? Could you name it, if there is? And could you a little bit elaborate why, if there is? That would be wonderful. <laughs> We are speaking um, about the waves, and uh, I think in this moment, uh, uh, ecologic situation, the, the changing uh, weather, uh, ask me, if I ask artists to think about, and sometimes uh, when uh, uh, I do, a, I don't know, a video installation, I am thinking about uh, energy, about uh, uh, how to find a, a way uh, to produce uh, yes, energy with, uh, I don't know, the sun. Uh, I am very sensitive in this moment with uh, ecologic problems. Yeah, you, you, I mean, your question is so, you know, that to answer it in three minutes doesn't give justice to it. But uh, the, the, the Pynchon Park idea was, was directly, even if it didn't want to be a didactic work, was directly connected to the fact that we've, we've reached a moment now where the where finally there is a possible discussion about our relation to other species and where the discussion, I think there are, there are different, different, uh, different things are very important at the moment is that you don't have this binary uh, male, female thing so strong anymore that there is really a, a zone that something has opened up really in, in many different ways. And also in relation with other, with, with, with animals, plants. The beautiful book of uh, Emanuele Cochia is really, I think for me, very, very, very strong in, um, in how, how, we, how we live in, a, I think the, it's also, it's interesting that in Munster, I think, some works like Eya Akawa that were a bit out of the city and combining some uh, and really in into the not and or into the woods like Heinfried Finson or that were in, in a zone that also Rem Kulas the other day described like this half country, half city. Yeah, what did they tell us? He talked about cows, no? They were the cows. The, the digital horses, the, the digital yeah, cows. Exactly. But also, suddenly I had the feeling that this zone were more, more like plants, meat, human meat, animal meat, like that the next thought we have to have is how, like in, in the urban context, it seems so difficult to to deal with uh, the with the um, biodiversity, and to somehow have a situation where you can connect, not in the old shamanic way to plants, animals, but still to, to get a feeling of biodiversity. And I have the feeling that in, in Munster, the, the, some of the works that were more in these zones, or Pierre, or that were more in these in-between zones, like not the urban, urban, but integrating other beings, other plants, they had us, it, it gave them a, that this, that their end, you can see, but, and this I don't know how it will influence us in the coming, but it seems that in the last uh, year, so many, there were so many shifts, new paradigms, unexpected things, how will this, change the art, I don't know, but there is a, and, and I don't know if this is also related to physics, only politics, or, but there, I think the art that is being doing now or in the next years has to be watched because it's also the thermometer or it's the pulsions of things that are 
moving. Not, it, I don't know. It, it's not the feeling you have that that there are there are really for for a long time. I mean, there were changes, but I have this feeling this year is very different somehow. Dominique, Marianne, Ange, thank you very very much. Thank you all.